DiscerningHearts.com presents Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. Dr. Lillis is an associate professor and the academic dean of St. John's Seminary in Camarillo, California, as well as the academic advisor for the St. Juan Diego House of Priestly Formation for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Through the years, clergy, seminarians, religious, and lay faithful have benefited from his lectures and retreat conferences on the Carmelite Doctors of the Church and the writings of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. He is the author of Hidden Mountain Secret Garden, a theological contemplation of prayer, as well as numerous other books focused on the spiritual life. In this series of conversations with Dr. Willis, we focus on Doctor of the Church, St. Teresa of Avila, and her great spiritual masterwork, The Interior Castle. Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Willis. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Who does counsel us, does she not, to seek help, to be open, to go to your confessor, to go to your guide, and just be honest and open. Am I reading her right on that? I think so. Honesty and uh, transparency and being willing to be vulnerable with another who has spiritual authority in your life is a tremendous grace. Jesus can do a lot with a soul that's like that. A soul that's a little bit maybe prideful and protective of their experiences. Part of the reason for the protectiveness or the the fear around those experiences is, is you're a little bit afraid to see the truth of them. And the reason why you don't want to see the truth is the truth keeps us humble. Something can be so lofty and then you see the truth of it and you realize, oh, you know, I have a long ways to go. The reality of that and accepting that is hard to do if you're not submitted to to someone spiritually in your life. Kind of experience though that we're about to talk about now, although it's the kind of thing you should also bring into spiritual direction, this one, it's unlikely that the evil one can deceive you. She says it's really hard to describe this one because precisely because you can't imagine it. It's really, you can't <laughs> describe things you can't imagine. The devil is delighted to see a soul troubled and distressed by the visions, knowing how this hinders it from employing itself wholly and loving and serving God. And so this is why she, don't be so concerned about the visions, but, but his majesty has far higher ways of communicating himself to the soul. They are less dangerous. For I do not think the evil spirit can imitate them. In fact, he can't. Uh, they are more difficult to explain. God is sometimes pleased while a person is engaged in prayer and in perfect possession of her senses to suspend them and to discover sublime mysteries to her which she appears to see within God himself. This is no vision of the most sacred humanity, nor can I rightly say the soul sees, for it sees nothing. This is no imaginary vision, but a highly intellectual one, wherein is manifested how all things are beheld in God and how he contains them in himself. It's very similar to what St. Thomas calls the gift of understanding and the gift of wisdom, how God contains them in himself, how um, all, all things are beheld in God. That's kind of understanding how he contains them in himself. Or it's a little bit like the gift of wisdom described by St. Thomas. It is of great value, for although passing in an instant, so this is a very momentary thing, it remains deeply engraved in the memory, producing a feeling of of great shame in the mind, which perceives more clearly the malice of offenses against God, since these most heinous sins are committed within his very being, since we dwell in him. What happens is there's a moment of truth there. I noticed there are a, a lot of people speaking about a grace called the manifestation of conscience that is uh, supposed to fall all over the world. Uh, all at once. And about the veracity of that or when or how and all of that, I'm no expert in that. And so I'm not even going to delve there. But it's likely that some who are hearing this recording 
well have heard、uh, prophecies that speak about a book has been written in recent years, also talking about this experience. What's interesting here is that Teresa is also saying that this is an experience that very advanced and spiritually mature people have as they approach the deepest intimacy with Christ Jesus. All of a sudden, the reality of sin presents itself with a kind of existential force that、uh, renews one's sense of shame. Forever having offended God, God's not trying to beat us up. In fact, He rather, kind of in a certain way, was discreet about how much pain our sins have caused Him. He's discreet because He doesn't want to discourage or shame us. He doesn't want us to be、uh, overwhelmed in despair when we see the gravity of our sins. So, in the very beginning, He just gives you a little bit. To help you repent and turn to Him and amend your life, to purify you more fully, and to humble you more deeply, in this most sublime moment of prayer, He reveals the full truth of who He is, and in that full truth,、uh, as you enter into it, you are in it already. He, in a certain way, opens the eyes of your heart. That's what an intellectual vision is. An intellectual vision is. The opening of the eyes of your heart, and when you open the eyes of your heart, you see the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You see Jesus, and this isn't your imagination dwelling upon his sacred humanity. This is the kind of truth where heart speaks to heart. The heart of Jesus unveils itself to you in a singular way, and it causes you to reassess. Everything you ever did, and everything you ever thought about yourself, and everything you ever thought about God, He is much better, much more wonderful, much more merciful than we can possibly Im- imagine or know. And only a soul that has had this experience has even begun to glimpse that total otherness of the Lord. And then the wonder. That we should have standing before Him grips the soul. It's so aware of how it's fallen short, and at the same time, is so aware that though it has fallen so short by the mercy of God, His sheer kindness and goodness, we stand there all the same. That God doesn't despise us, but despite all the pain and suffering we have caused in the world and. Kind of being hostile to him and his plan, despite all of that, he still wants us to draw close to him. He still loves us. He hopes in us. We can hope in him because he hopes in us even more. He wants us to be part of his plan. Purpose here isn't to beat yourself up over what happened in the past and what you can't do anything about. Purpose isn't to make you withdraw in shame. The purpose is to move you with gratitude for how much God loves you. She says a line that Saint Bernard also reflects on. She says, "What happens when this ex- you have this experience of the truth of His total love and goodness, and the truth of our action in front of Him? What happens when you see this is that you realize all at once that all men are liars." Now, for those of you who know the writings of Saint Bernard, you know that Saint Bernard reflects on this very same thing when he talks about the three steps of humility. The first step of humility is to realize that I myself am a miserable wretch in need of salvation. The soul who advances to the sixth mansion, I've already just described. Is acutely aware of how much it needs salvation. As you grow in the life of prayer, you don't have a sense, a diminishing sense of、uh, how much you need salvation. You actually have a growing sense of it. It becomes kind of existentially alive for you that you need a savior. You need Jesus, and when you see His heart with the eyes of your heart, when you have、um, this kind of face to face with Jesus, heart to heart with Jesus. You realize how much you need him, and at the same time, you also realize that everybody needs him. Your heart aches 
because you see that all of us are trapped in all kinds of different lies. What we call truth is, um, is just a shadow of what the truth really is. And as long as we're trapped in lies and falsehoods and fantasies, we don't have ground that's firm enough to bear the weight of our existence. We realize that only he can bear the weight of our existence, my existence and yours. All men are liars. This isn't to sit in judgment over everybody else. It's to realize that all of us together are in a terrible plight. We need the truth of God or we are lost. This vision helps us understand and see at once this truth that God wants us to know saves us. It rescues our integrity, our dignity, our greatness. It restores our place in the world. And we cannot get it unless God shows it to us. And that's why this level of prayer where Jesus gives us this intellectual vision is so very, very important for not only our own growth and holiness and perfection and love, but actually for the whole world. Is it the same type of truth that we hear echo in the writings or the experience better? Maybe I should say the experience of St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross. You could say, couldn't you, that Teresa of Avila was, in a sense, a, a spiritual mother, a, a spiritual mentor to her through her writings and through her profession and everything. Truth is truth. It's all, it's everything. Do you know what I'm trying to articulate here, Anthony? I think that you find this echoed in the writings of St. Benedicta of the Cross, because she is a daughter of Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross. It's something that you actually, if you look carefully, uh, you find even in the writings of saints who didn't write that much at all, uh, the, the, in the lives of the saints who, who didn't write that much, the Curie Dars, his witness is filled with an experience like this in the background. And it wasn't that he was seeing this all the time. You don't have to see it all the time. It's a single instant, and this strikes you. The manifestation of conscience that occurs when Jesus opens the eyes of your heart, when his heart speaks to your heart, it's a definitive moment that changes you forever because now you know the truth. Uh, John of the Cross says that a soul that has this kind of experience, this is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with his writings, when he talks about a message sent to us that uh, while a preacher or an angel is, is speaking to our hearts, there's another voice or something else that's communicated to us over and above their words, over and above their message, over and above the content of the gospel, the content of the gospel bears Christ himself. And when Christ himself is spoken into you, that's this intellectual vision. Everything changes, even in a single instant. That's what's being described here. And I am firmly convinced that Edith Stein had this experience and that it was part of um, of her own spiritual growth as Jesus prepared her for martyrdom. There's one other aspect to this too that I talk about kind of, I, we've already talked about, you know, the kind of, you could say a crisis of truth that happens when this is spoken to you. Because you see the truth, you all of a sudden realize that the way you've responded to trials and crises in your life up to this point isn't sufficient. When you see how much Jesus is actually born for your sake, the wounds he suffered for you, and the scourges that he allowed, the stripes that heal us, when you see this, all of a sudden you, your own attitude towards suffering also changes. You see the truth of it. She says it's not enough to bear it patiently, but rather we need to bear them with alacrity, which means a ready cheerfulness. Instead of being kind of depressed and downtrodden because somebody has done something unfair, once you see what Jesus has done for us, you are disposed and you want to work for, even if you can't do it very well, to uh, cheerfully bear it 
because of the immensity of what Jesus has already borne for you. You are trying to repay him love for love. Let us love our enemies since this great God has not ceased to love us in spite of our many sins. This is indeed the chief reason that all should forgive any harm done to them. I assure you, daughters, that though this vision passes quickly, our Lord has bestowed signal grace on her to whom he grants it, if she seeks to profit by it, by keeping it constantly in mind. If you remember the truth that Jesus shows you in this vision, it will help you forgive your enemies, and it will help you to be cheerful even in the face of great indignation, you people humiliating you, sliding you, you will be able to respond cheerfully if you think about this image. I realize that most of you who are listening have not experienced this fully. Maybe some of you have, but hasn't there been hints of this in your life up till now? Hints of how much God loves you? And it's true, we ha we're we powerless by ourselves to forgive or forget an offense. It's hard to forgive, and it's hard to let go of bitterness and so forth. But if we turn our minds and our hearts to how much God has loved us and ask him to give us the cheerfulness we need to love our enemies and to pray for them, Jesus will hear that prayer. The soul that submits itself to the Holy Spirit will learn how to intercede for its enemies and have compassion on them. This grace of an intellectual vision confirms all those smaller graces that helped us forgive our enemies. And so there, there's something deeply good in this. In other words, this grace, when you see this vision, rather than puff you up with pride, this grace humbles you. It humbles you to the very core. And in humility, when we are humbled to the very core, that's where we found the ground to be free to love. This grace is a great grace because it humbles you to the core. And in being humbled to the core, now you are free to love. No matter what happens, nothing can hold your love back. So it's a, a very powerful, powerful grace she's describing. My goodness, Anthony, and we're still in the sixth mansion. There's still so much more that she wants to share with us. And yet it's only the tip of the iceberg, isn't it, in the spiritual life? I mean, ultimately, as you just described, there's so much more that the soul and its relationship with the one who created it. It's extraordinary, isn't it? This chapter on intellectual vision the very last paragraph, I've been thinking about it. Our Lord shows the soul these favors because she is now indeed his bride, resolute to do his will in all things. So what she she's referring to, it, an image she has, you could say the first four mansions were kind of uh, in a dating relationship, a courtship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And in the fifth mansion, where mystical prayer becomes more normative in your life, rather than just an occasional thing, but something that normally characterizes the way you pray. This is an espousal, she calls it. And that espousal becomes a marriage. And the marriage becomes fruitful. The fruitfulness kind of begins here. When Jesus communicates the word of truth to you, this is, you might say, the seed of his fruitfulness into your soul. Now humbled, you can do great things for God. And I guess I'm spending a little bit of time saying that this is a good thing because sometimes when you hear humbled and you're having to deal with the truth of who you are and where you actually are in relation to God, that could scare people away. Or it could provide the impression that somehow God wants to shame us. And, and that, that's just wrong. He humbles to exalt us. He helps us realize the truth of where we're actually at so that he can raise us up. And raise us up for what? Raise us up to love. This bride, which is you, the soul, is resolute to do his will in all things. Therefore, he wishes to give her some idea how to accomplish his will and to manifest to her some of his divine attributes. Now, this 
last line. Why do we do the will of God? What's the purpose? The reason why we do the will of God is so that who he is, the greatness of his mystery, might be known in the world. God is hidden from every created eye, but we who do his will manifest him in the world. We manifest his attributes, his mercy, his goodness, his truth, his justice, his glory, his splendor. A splendor is the way an attribute is made known in the created world. And so the mercy of God in the divine essence, which we do not see, that the attribute of God's mercy is totally beyond our natural powers to know, and our limited creaturehood can never grasp it. And yet God chooses to manifest his mercy into the world. When he manifests his mercy in the world, that's a splendor. And how does he manifest it in the world? By us doing his will. When we do God's will, we actually participate in his splendor in a way that allows others to know the Lord and in him find their salvation. Forever I will sing the glory of the Lord. The splendors of the Lord are what we unveil when we sing the glories. And to sing the glories of the Lord uh, means to actually raise our voices in song, but it has to do with the way we live and relate and everything reveals the splendor of God's glory. If you followed all of that, if any of that makes sense at all, this idea of participating in the splendor of God's attributes, of all of his adorable perfections, this is also in the writings of Elizabeth of the Trinity at the end of her retreats, especially to Margaret when she talks about the praise of glory, and to her sisters too in her last retreat. She talks about this participation in God that manifests his sheer goodness and generosity and kindness and love in the world. This is exactly where Teresa of Avila is taking us. Let's keep going there. Let's keep going. Thank you so much, Anthony. You're welcome. It's great to be with you, and I'm looking forward to our next adventure. Yes, chapter 11. My goodness, we'll actually be at the last chapter of book six, The Sixth Mansion. Thank you so much, Anthony. Okay, God bless you. You've been listening to Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lillis. To hear and or to download this conversation, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. There, too, you will find an audio version of The Interior Castle by St. Teresa of Avila, the masterwork in which this series has been based. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for Beginning to Pray with Dr. Anthony Lewis.